Okay, so today we have a special episode. We are speaking to an economist from the University of Chicago who researches the creativity cycle in art. His discoveries, the two types of innovators, the conceptual and experimental. We will discuss the different types, how Picasso and Steve Jobs are related, why do employers need to rethink hiring older employees, how did an experimental innovator in business get his Nobel Prize for Peace, and what business organizations can learn from art history classes. All and more in this episode. His name is David Gallenson, and he's speaking to us from Chicago. So I hope you will enjoy it. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guest, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey, podcast listeners. Thank you again for joining us today for another episode of the Artian Podcast, where we explore the relationship between art, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Today, we have a special guest. His book surprised me and inspired me. In a way, I think it is the story of my life when it comes to innovation. His name is David Gallenson, and his book is Young Geniuses and Old Masters. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. Well, David is a professor in the Department of Economics and the College of the University of Chicago. He has been a visiting professor at the California Institute of Technology, MIT, the University of Texas at Austin. He is the academic director of the Center for Creativity Economics at the Universidad del Sema in Buenos Aires. And his unique research field, the economics of art. You might have heard David at Malcolm Gladwell podcast Revision It History, and today we actually have the chance to dive deep to some of his unique revelations that you will hear in a second. David, first of all, thank you very, very much for taking the time to speak with me and share your amazing and insightful discoveries that, as we talked, made me even understand better where I am. It's a pleasure. I love this work. I had an experience very much like you. This work helped me understand my own processes of research. And I just, I love talking about this with people who are interested in it. So David, maybe you can share with us, actually, what attracted you to art? Why you have this connection with this world of art as an economist? I've always loved art. My grandfather was a painter and he died before I was born, but my mother loved art because of him. And she took me to museums when I was a kid, and, and I just loved them. I, also, I had an aunt and uncle who were art collectors in New York City. And when I went to New York, I just loved going to art galleries and museums with them. So, I mean, art has just been a part of my life. I grew up with my grandfather's paintings. You know, they were all over our house. Now you have this background in the world of art, but what is your main research study? You know, very few people understand this. I mean, very few of my colleagues understand this, but to me... This is all part of the same research project. I, I have a PhD in economics. I, I'm an economic historian by training. And in my early work, early work, I mean several decades, I always did a particular kind of research where I, had, I created data sets based on observations of large numbers of individuals, right? And it so happens that I mostly studied uh, bound labor in colonial America. So I had data sets made up of 25,000 indentured servants. 100,000 slaves and so on. But it was always studying in some fashion the careers of individuals. And, and so this work came sort of seamlessly. I mean, I, I've always looked at the relationship between age and productivity. And this is just another illustration of that. And this illustration, tell us briefly before we dive deep into it, because I think the story how you got to this actually is interesting. It was a very specific episode. Uh, before there was Art Basel, before there were all these art fairs in the world, there was Art Expo in Chicago. And galleries would come from all over the world. And I loved going to it. And so I think it was 1997. I, was, uh, I wanted to buy a small painting by an artist named Saul LeWitt from a New York dealer with the unlikely name of Gracie Mansion, right? It was a small painting at Art Expo. And it so happened that LeWitt's business agent was a very old friend of my cousin. And she had made me promise never to buy any of his work. 
without talking to her. So I called her. She asked me how large the painting was and what the price was. And then she immediately said, that's overpriced. We're selling that size for less. And I said, yeah, but you're selling new ones. This one's 10 years old. And she said it didn't matter. Well, you know, for 20 years, I've been studying the relationship between age and productivity. And it doesn't stay constant over people's lives. And so I thought that was very bizarre. And so I looked for literature and I couldn't find a single study on the relationship between age and productivity for painters. So I set out to do that using auction data. We put a lot of auction records into the computer. For, you know, we took 20 years worth of data for, for roughly two dozen contemporary artists. And what were your discoveries from this well, research? For, for, for each painter, we estimated a regression equation in which the price of the painting was a function of the artist's age when he or she had made it. And then we controlled the size of the painting when it was sold and so on. And these turned out to be the most surprising empirical results I'd ever seen. Because the painters divided in two. The first half was not particularly surprising. For about half the, the artists, the price increased with the age at which they had created the painting. That wasn't terribly surprising. But for about half the artists, and these were great artists, very famous artists, the price was positively, was, was sorry, inversely related to age. So as they got older, after their 20s, in some sense, they were actually getting worse. Now, no economist had ever found this relationship for any activity. You can find it for athletes, but painting and Olympic swimming are not comparable activities. So, you know, this was an enormous puzzle. And I, you know, I, my thesis advisor was a very famous, he was a very great economic historian. And he always said, it's when you get a result you don't understand, that's when you have a chance of learning something. So I went about trying to understand this. And my instinct is to study individuals. So I started studying these artists individually. And I discovered that there, was, there were systematic differences between the people whose prices went up with age and down with age. They had different goals and they used different methods. And you defined it as experimental and conceptual innovators. And that was, I think, kind of the aha moment when I read the book. We will dive, in, dive deep into that in a second. It's kind of reflected in the world of entrepreneurship. But before that, I want to ask you, what's, what is conceptual innovator? What is experimental innovator? And what defines them? Conceptual innovators want to communicate ideas or emotions, right? And your ideas are your own and your emotions are your, your own. You can know them completely. And as a result, they can know precisely what they want to do. They have very specific goals for their works. So, I mean, I'll talk about this for painting, but it extends to other disciplines. You just have to sort of change the, you know, the technology. So painters can make, and conceptual artists almost do, almost always do make preparatory sketches for their paintings. Now they do them in the computer very often, but it's the same thing. Before they make the work, they know exactly what they want it to look like. And there are a number of things that follow from that. Uh, their innovations typically appear suddenly and completely. Again, it's the idea that's the contribution. And so they can be embodied in individual breakthrough work. Throughout the history of art, the most famous paintings are disproportionately made by conceptual innovators because they announce major innovations. Now, there's the relationship with age. That's where I started. Now, new ideas say, well, they can come anytime because they come very quickly. But it turns out that the most radical new ideas, and therefore the most important, usually arrive when the artist is young. It's not actually chronological age that matters, but chronological age and experience in the discipline are usually highly correlated. Most people start an activity like painting when they're young. And young painters are the ones who disproportionately make conceptual innovations because they haven't had time to develop fixed habits of thought. See, for conceptual innovators, Fixed habits of, of thought are the enemy because they constrain you in trying to think of dramatic new ideas. And that's why young innovators in any discipline, physics, art, you name it, tend to be young people. They are trying to escape the box, as we say, kind of think outside of the box in the, what they are doing, whether it is art or science, as you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is that they very often say they don't even see the box. I mean, somebody asked Bob Dylan, you know, if he had consciously broken the rules of popular singing. And he said, I didn't even see the rules. And that's a very common refrain because they're very young, they're inexperienced. And these are iconoclasts. These are revolutionaries. Revolutionary is not just a metaphor. I mean, political revolutions are not created by old people. 
So can you give us some examples? So you speak about the fact that, first of all, conceptual innovators actually are more focused on the idea, rather maybe on the materials. They do a lot of preparation and they are trying to kind of escape maybe old tradition or maybe don't even know the old tradition just to create something totally new, totally different. Give us some example for those uh, conceptual innovators. My classic example of a conceptual innovator, you know, I started studying painting and it turned out this is one of the great conceptual innovators of the 20th century in any activity. I mean, I, you know, when I started this project, I would have said Picasso was the most important painter of the 20th century. Now I would actually say he's the most important artist of the 20th century. We can talk about why that is. But he said, I don't paint what I see. I paint what I think, right? Again, experimentalists are visual in some sense, whether they're painters, novelists, economists, you name it, right? But he said, I don't paint what I see, I paint what I think. And so, for example, I mean, he'd and say, well, that's just, those are just words, right? No, they aren't. His most famous innovation was cubism. And it really illustrates this statement. In a cubist painting, we don't simply see people from one point of view as I'm looking at your face, right? That's an, that an experimentalist would paint what he sees, right? In fact, in cubism, we see people from many points of view. So when Picasso did a portrait, he said, look, I'm looking at your face, but I know there's a back of your head. I can paint that too. My work is based on knowledge. So when you look at a, at a, at a cubist painting, it has all these little pieces, and it's as if I took photographs of you, I walked around you taking photographs, I cut them up and I, and I stuck them together. So you'll see a face, you'll see an ear, you'll see a, the back of the head and so on. This is an art that expresses knowledge. It shows people in the round, right? Impossibly, right? There are, there are a number of figures that Picasso created that are impossible. Now, you know, again, the youth. Picasso made his most important painting, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, which is in the Museum of Monterey in New York, yeah. when he was 26 years old. That announced the arrival of Cubism. So that painting makes the point, you know, it makes several points here. One is, you know, you talked about pre preparatory works. Picasso wanted to create a masterpiece. He wanted... A, Matisse at that point was king of the hill. He was somewhat older than Picasso. He was the great avant-garde yeah. painter. And he had just made a, a, a big splash with a very large painting, The Joy of Life. And Picasso was very jealous. So he spent an entire year making preparatory works for the Demoiselle. This is a young painter, didn't have a lot of money, spent a year making something like five or 600 preparatory studies for the Demoiselle. The largest number of preparatory studies for a single painting ever made in the history of Western art. Amazing. And he did produce a masterpiece deliberately. That painting is now the most important painting of the 20th century. That appears in something like 95% of art textbooks that cover that period. No other painting appears in more than half. But it also makes this point about impossibility because, for example, the Demoiselle is five nude female figures. The one furthest on the right is a squatting figure. You see her from her body from the back. You see her face from the front. That's impossible. That's knowledge. Human beings can't swivel their heads 180 degrees. That was making the point. I, I don't paint what I see. I paint what I think. So, you know, you mentioned that uh, it's not only the most important uh, painting of the 20th century. You mentioned that, in your opinion, Picasso is the most important artist of the 20th century. I'm interested. Why do you think he's the most important painter of the 20th century? One of the issues that I had to deal with when I started this project was this is about, you know, you see, one question was, what makes a painting valuable? Why are some of the why are the peaks of some of these these painters early and some late? Well, what you start to realize, art historians don't like to state things simply. They don't like it when I do. But if you read their texts, you'll see that they understand the good ones. That an important painting doesn't depend on beauty or anything else. It depends on innovation. It's doing something new. So the peak of the age price profile is the artist's most innovative work. Now the Demoiselle is an innovation. It's a radical innovation. It's the most radical innovation that Picasso made in his career. Again, introduced cubism, introduced all these new ways of, I mean, it's, it's innovative both in this idea that you can look at people from points of view simultaneously, but it also introduces this personalized view of the world. Artists are no longer constrained. I mean, for centuries and centuries, the idea of a painting was, a painting was supposed to be a window on the world. Picasso said, no, this isn't a window. This is... In thinking. my mind, yeah. So, you and know... That's a, that was an, an enormously liberating thing for young painters. Old painters said, this is disgusting. This is disgraceful. He's desecrating art. The young painters said, I'm free. 
Yeah, I remember I just read the book about the story of the painting that changed the world. And one of the colleagues of, uh, I think it was the rain that said uh, Picasso to say to another friend, I hope that one day we won't find Picasso hanging himself. They were so doubtful about the attempt that he had that they thought he was going to kill himself because he won't be successful. That was a reference, actually, to this novella that we had talked about earlier before this interview started by, by Honoré de Balzac <laughs> called The Chez de la Cadu, the, the unknown masterpiece, in which the artist's failure to complete a painting did lead him to kill himself and to burn his studio. But that's a misunderstanding. That was an experimental painter. Frenhofer in, in the Balzac was experimental. Picasso would never have hanged himself. He was always satisfied with what he did. But you know, I digressed and I didn't answer your question. I can answer it very briefly. Why do I consider Picasso the most important artist of the 20th century? And the extent of the importance of a painter, or a novelist or an economist, depends on the extent of your influence. Picasso changed painting, right? Virtually every art movement of the 20th century was either following Picasso or reacting to him. So he, he changed painting, but it didn't stop there. He changed the novel. He changed poetry. He changed cinema. For example, how did he change cinema? Well, for example, Eisenstein was tremendously excited by, Eisenstein was the greatest living movie director, He was excited by cubism. The idea of cubism facets, it breaks things up into little pieces. The average shot length of a Hollywood movie at the time was about 10 seconds. Eisenstein cut it to about a second. And this was under the inspiration of cubism. The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot is a poem that broke with traditional rules of continuity, right? New speakers come in without explanation. It's jumbled. That was a That was a direct consequence of the editing of Ezra Pound. Ezra Pound was a great poet. He was a close friend of, of Gertrude Stein. He knew Cubism in Paris. Eliot had no interest in Cubism, but it was Ezra Pound who put that into the wasteland. Then, for example, in the novel, now it's generally considered the greatest novel in English in the 20th century, James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, every chapter is in a different style. Again, that's... That, That idea comes from Picasso. See, another aspect of this, of the, the conceptual innovator is a conceptual innovator can embody a new idea in a single work. And he can be perfectly pleased that he has expressed that idea so he can change to another idea. And Picasso did that frequently. So here he is influencing the novel. Uh, Cubism influenced architecture. You know, I grew up in the, in the 1950s and 60s The, the advanced architecture of the time was these skyscrapers that were made up of concrete boxes placed on top of each other. That came from de Stiel in Holland, and de Stiel was directly influenced by the faceting of cubism, and on and on, right? Picasso influenced more other artists of all kinds by far than any other artist of any kind in the 20th century. Obviously, I guess that many of the listeners are, can relate to conceptual innovators and understand in the conceptual innovators in relation to the young and the age and ideas, etc. But I think what struck me with your book is actually the other type of innovators, the experimental one. Explain us a bit about the experimental, because I think in a way, as I mentioned at the beginning, when I read about experimental innovation, it kind of was an aha moment. Well, the problem is that we're brainwashed because the popular image of creativity is this momentary flash of genius. You know, in comic strips, the light bulb goes on. Yeah, exactly, the stuff. eureka That's moment. Innovation. Um, and it's certainly true. It's more conspicuous, right? Conceptual innovations are dramatic. They're celebrated immediately. They instantly change people's lives. And one of the, the clearest expressions of this, Francois Truffaut, when he was 16 years old in Paris, He saw Citizen Kane and he said, in that moment, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Right? That's conceptual innovation. It's done suddenly and it, it's, it's clear. He understood immediately. And, and it's also true that the conceptual innovators are almost always these young, brash people who will tell you that they're geniuses. And so they, you know, they shout from the rooftops, this is an innovation, I'm a genius. And in many cases, it's true. Picasso said that, Orson Welles said that, Bob Dylan said that, and on and on, right? But there's this other very quiet form of innovation. And these people have the opposite kind of personality. They're always saying, 
I haven't done anything very important. Now, Cezanne is the, the, the quintessential experimental innovator. At the end of his life, he would say, I'm not satisfied with my work. I haven't really accomplished nearly as much as I wanted. Yeah, the, the point here is experimental innovators are not interested in ideas, but in vision, perception in general, right? Vision for painters, but then perception for novelists. They want to paint what they see, what they experience. Now, that's not a precise goal. And notice, you see, conceptual innovation is generated in your mind, and you can, you can know your ideas completely. But, of course, we all know we can't experience the outside world completely. I mean, there's this exercise we do in the United States when you're, I don't know, fourth grade or something. The teacher says, look, take it half an hour and just write down a description of this room. And, of course, then the point is you can't, you'd spend your entire life describing the room and you'd never come to the end. It's, you know, because basically perception is, is infinitely complicated. So these artists are never sure what they want to do in terms of translating their vision to, you know, to a two-dimensional canvas in this case. They work tentatively and incrementally. This is why I call them experimental. The first definition of experimental in the Oxford English Dictionary is trial and error. So they rarely feel they've succeeded. Their careers are often dominated by the pursuit of a single goal because you can't quite get there. You can never, Cezanne would say, I can't realize. These artists repeat themselves. They do the same thing over and over, changing it very, very gradually, right? They're, they're very cautious. They rarely make preparatory studies of any kind because they want to make discoveries in the process of working. And again, not just true for painters, true for novelists. Experimentalist, experimental novelists change their plots as they work. Poets change their works and so on. These people tend to improve with age because they build their skills. They improve their abilities gradually as they work. So you spoke about Picasso doing his breakthrough at the age of 26, and you spoke about Cezanne. What age Cezanne did his own breakthrough? There's no single masterpiece by Cezanne. If you asked a dozen art history professors, what's the greatest painting Picasso ever made? Unless they were deliberately trying to be perverse, they would all say the Demoiselle d'Avignon. If you ask the same dozen professors the greatest painting by Cezanne, they named name 12 different paintings, right? There's no one Cezanne masterpiece. There are series of paintings. The thing he loved the most was the landscape of his native Provence. He loved the Mont Saint-Victoire. He painted it something like 50 times over a period of 30 years. But the views that are most likely to appear in textbooks of art history are the very latest ones. It's the ones he made he died at 67, the ones he made from 64, 65, 66, 67. Those are the, the most fully developed, or he would have said realized. So from one point, we have Picasso at the age of 26, and from the other point, we have Cezanne at the age of 64, 65, 66. Such a huge difference in age between the different breakthroughs. They were born 40 years apart, but they did their greatest work within a two-year period, chronologically. Wow. Yeah, I remember that uh, Picasso also got inspired by uh, Cezanne approach to reduce the painting to the three elements. Yeah, again, they, the conceptualists are, are simplifiers. Cezanne would have hated if anybody said there are three key elements of your painting. It, it, to him, it was an ensemble. You couldn't separate things. But the conceptualists simplify things very much. Can you give us more examples for painters? That well, you know, you're, you're in Spain. Um, two of the greatest experimental painters in Western history were Velázquez and Goya. I guess you would say Velázquez, right, Velázquez. and Goya. Yeah. Um, if you walk through the Prado, you see why they were great experimentalists. Why? Descri painted... Describe it to our listeners. I have the great fortune to be able to go to the Prado on my weekends, but why Velázquez and Goya were experimental? They painted real people. Right. If you walk through the Prado, you're not looking at idealized people. You're not looking at symbols, even in the religious paintings. Velasquez, see, experimentalists tend not to make religious paintings because they don't believe in symbolism. But Velasquez, early in his career, had to paint to make money before he became the, the close friend of the king. He had to paint religious figures. Even the angels are not imaginary. So if you look at a Raphael, he painted perfection. You know, women who are not real. They, they're, they're imaginary. I mean, he wrote to a patron once and he said, um, I'm doing an altarpiece for you. I haven't found a woman beautiful enough to sit for the virgin, but it's all right because I have an image of a perfectly beautiful woman in my head. Velasquez never painted... So Rafael is a, is a conceptual. One of the great, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, and see, Velasquez, I mean, even they, they famously, the king, was it Philip IV, something like that? Philip IV, yeah, Philip IV was the one that they were very close he to He loved Velasquez, Velasquez yeah. but at some point he stopped having Velasquez paint him because it, it, it hurt him too much to see himself aging in Velasquez's paintings. Now, Raphael simply would have continued to paint him as a young man. He would have had no problem. <laughs> Velas Velasquez couldn't do that, even, even for his friend and his patron, right? And Velasquez, again, go to the Prado, his, his great masterwork. He painted Las Meninas when he was 57 years old. To me, not his greatest painting. The greatest paintings were to come later. You know, but if you walk through those wonderful rooms up to that, you're seeing real people. You feel you can, you, these are people you could know. And you know, the same thing is true of Goya. If you look at, there's a wonderful small self-portrait he made at about the age of 60. And here he was, the greatest painter in the world. He consorted with kings and, and aristocrats. He painted himself in very plain clothing as a real person. You could imagine, you know, sitting down in a bar and, and, uh, and starting to talk to the guy next to you, and that could have been Goya. And Goya made these amazing black paintings when he was in his 60s. Yeah. Uh, one of the greatest, you know, the greatest of these tropes, when Goya was 82 years old, he made a drawing of an old man with a long white beard walking with two canes. And the caption is, I'm still learning. That's the credo. Of the experimentalists yeah and he was he it's true his art never stopped changing conceptualists very often become the captives of their early work and they just repeat themselves over and over experimentalists don't great ones velasquez's work is always changing you can see that if you look at the dates of the paintings and the same thing is is, is very much true of goya I mean, when he made the black paintings these are horrible paintings they're horrible subjects and he suited the technique to the work the technique is crude, not because he didn't have fine technique. You can see that anywhere else, you know, in the Prado, but because he wanted to show the crudeness of these people and he did it with these very crude brushstrokes. Yeah, David, this, by the way, my favorite paintings by Goya, because nobody can stay still when you see this painting. You can hate it, you can love it, but there is one thing for sure, you have a reaction to it. Such a strong painting. Wow. So, so you spoke about Velázquez and Goya as experimentals. Do you have more Spanish painters that you will consider them as conceptuals beside the Picasso? Well, you know, more, more recently, Juan Miro um, was an experimentalist. And again, there's an evolution in his work. And he talked about the fact, he wrote letters when he was young, and he said, I don't want to find my style too young because the style constrains you. I want to evolve. I want to get better as I get older. The artist he most admired were people who got, got better as they got older. And would you consider Dali as a conceptual? Highly. Right? Dali made great work when he was in his 20s, and then his work... Yeah, uh, declined. Well, you know, yeah. He basically yeah. did, I remember, he did in his 60s, he did a commercial for uh, medicine or something like this. Yeah, I mean, he virtually stopped being a serious artist. It's ironic because he was actually, you know, he was expelled from the Surrealist movement by André Breton because he was a sellout. He lived about 50 years too early. Andy Warhol did exactly the same thing. And Andy Warhol is the most important artist of the, of the second half of the 20th century. <laughs> and Andy Warhol is fascinated with Dali, by the way. I mean, Dali was sort of, he, was, uh, he couldn't be uh, taken seriously by important artists, but Warhol made no secret of the fact he was fascinated by Dali. He always made a point when Dali was in New York of going and seeing him. Um, so, you know, our attitudes have changed. But Dali, in his lifetime, was, con was considered a sellout. Uh, Andre Breton made a, um, what do you call it? You know, you, you rearrange the letters of someone's name. And there's an, is it an anagram? I can't remember. Salvador Dali became Avida Dollars. It's true. So before we continue, I want to, uh, to speak with you about experimental and conceptual innovation in the world of business and entrepreneurship. Let's take a short break. How often do you hear you should develop your empathy, be more human-centric at your work, and create more meaningful experiences? But are you trained for these demands? In our work at The Artian, artistic mindset and competencies are core to our business training, whether it's empathy, meaningful experiences, or creativity. Art is the environment to develop them. Do you want to learn how you can benefit from our art-based training? Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N dot com for more details. Thank you very much uh, for 
Coming back, we just spoke with David about experimental and conceptual innovation. Now, why I think this book was kind of a revelation for me, I'm involved in the world of the startups and technology and entrepreneurship for many, many years. And obviously, we see the same pattern in a way, mainly the same pattern of conceptual innovation. And Steve Jobs is a, a famous to say that if by the age of 30, you didn't do something important, most likely you won't do. And I think this kind of perception discourage people to kind of try and build something when they are 40s, 50s and older in their entrepreneurial aspiration. And I wonder, David, do you see the same pattern in the world of entrepreneurship, this ability to have experimental and conceptual? Absolutely. I mean, not only are there the two types, but they understand it. I mean, very often the, the conceptualists don't recognize the experimentalists and vice versa. But they understand which type they are. And in fact, I mean, you mentioned Steve Jobs. Jo Steve Jobs not only understood that he was conceptual in my language, but he actually learned from, from prior conceptual innovators. See, the thing that, that distinguishes Jobs most clearly from all of these other billionaires in Silicon Valley was not the magnitude of his innovations, but the sheer number, right? He invented the iMac, the iPad, the iPhone, the iPod. And they all serve very different purposes. That wasn't just, you know, Windows 2.1, Windows 2.2, Windows 2.3. He made fun of Windows for that, for always doing the same thing. Um, they did very different things. This is, again, this is like Picasso changing styles or Bob Dylan changing styles. And in fact, see, as you said, Jobs was afraid of losing his creativity. He did a famous interview when he was turning 30. And he said, you know, everybody knows that you don't do anything creative after 30. And he said, your only chance is to, to avoid this comes from people like, and he mentioned specifically Bob Dylan and Pablo Picasso. He said that you have to keep trying new things. And he said, you know, that's dangerous because you may fail. If you keep doing Windows 2.1, 2.2, you're going to make a lot of money and you'll never fall on your face. You'll never embarrass yourself. But he said the real integrity of an artist is to keep changing. He said, Dylan and Picasso were always risking failure. And that was his credo. That was very, very you know, explicitly what, what he wanted to do. So you mentioned a beautiful anecdote that actually Steve Jobs was very inspired by Bob Dylan. And in Bob Dylan me Memorium, he actually spoke about Picasso. And it's actually how all the three of them are linked together. Yeah, I mean, Dylan understood this as well. If you read his Chronicles Volume 1, his memoir, He talks about the fact that as a young artist, in, as a young singer in Greenwich Village, when he'd first arrived there, he read in the newspaper, Picasso had just gotten remarried for the fourth time at the age of 85. And Jobs said, this is somebody who never stood still. He kept changing. And he said, that's the way I want to be. And he was. He would, you know, Dylan, Joyce Carol Oates, the writer, said that Dylan changed so much from album to album in style and in voice and even in appearance that He must be a fictional character. He couldn't be real. And in a sense, he was a fictional character. He was a creation of himself. This wasn't, you know, people like Pete Seeger would say, you know, the folk singer said, you know, Dylan's not sincere. He's not authentic. Joni Mitchell's famously said that. She's, you know, another popular singer. Um, nobody knows what the real Dylan is like, right? Mm. Because he, he creates what these personas You know, persona came, it's the term that comes from the masks that actors wore in Greek tragedies to show you whether they were happy, whether they were sad and so on. And they're masks you put on. And so it's, you know, Dylan is an example of somebody who creates personas to keep people at bay. He quotes constantly from other people. What's his real language? And there's a debate about whether there is such a thing. I read few also of your articles on the Huffington Post and you started to relate it also to our perception of the job environment, that we love success and we love the youth and we love the young ones that are creative and inspirational and innovative. And we often tend to forget about the older generation. And it's very common that at the age of 40, 45, they tell you, okay, I don't, I'm not sure what I can do with you. But you actually claim something different. And I want to hear yeah, your it, take on that. As you say, in our society, there's this very long-standing belief, not only in society at large, but even among... The academic experts who have studied creativity are psychologists. And if you read their work, they will say creativity is for young people. Wisdom is for old people, but wisdom and creativity are opposite values. 
And that's false, right? But many false beliefs like this one have led to discrimination. And again, this one is no exception. Um, in the 1960s, an American doc medical doctor named Robert Butler coined the term ageism to call attention specifically to this form of, of discrimination. And it, it, you know, it, it, was, it was a parallel to racism and sexism. Um, but naming something doesn't get rid of it. So Silicon Valley suffers very, very much from this. You can still find you know, famous innovators in Silicon Valley saying, you know, we only want to hire young people because they're the innovative ones. Uh, this is a very powerful assumption, very hard to get rid of, but it's false. So we, do, we should not forget the experimental innovators, the ones that take years to get to successes. Yeah, I mean, the Warren Buffetts of the world, um, or the Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc was the founder of McDonald's, right? And see, it comes out of their experience. Warren Buffett, has, he talks to somebody who owns a company, and he, he evaluates them personally in 15 minutes. It's his intuition, which is wisdom, which is knowledge, it's judgment. Ray Kroc was a guy who delivered, he was a delivery driver. He, dri he delivered refrigerators to restaurants and he was always annoyed by the fact that he couldn't get a quick lunch. So, you know, and, and so you know, this is a guy who's in and out of kitchens all the time. He invented McDonald's and it was purely experiential. It wasn't some you know, immediate, it wasn't some theoretical discovery. It was a purely empirical one. It was a practical matter. Yeah, I think the founder of KFC was the same. There are a group of great entrepreneurs that started after their late 50s or the mid 50s. So, David, I wonder, what makes a conceptual innovator successful? Conceptual innovators need to make these sudden discoveries, right? And the way they do that is by simplifying problems. Um, to focus on, as you said, a very few essential elements. Um, and, you know, I come back to Steve Jobs. Steve Wozniak said, Steve Jobs didn't do one circuit design or piece of code. He didn't have the technical skills. But he was the one who had the ideas. Then he found other people to make them. Jobs said, when you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do anything. They just saw something. So the, the point here is they're making connections among things that weren't previously connected. And it's easier to do that when you don't see the complexity. You see something very, very simple. Again, Orson Welles was asked, how could you make the greatest movie ever made when you, your first movie, you're 26 years old. And he said, innocence, innocence, innocence. And he said, if that doesn't work for you, try ignorance, ignorance, ignorance. And he used to talk about, you know, he said, if you're walking along the edge of a cliff, um, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the, the void on the side, you'd be terrified. But if you don't even know the void is there, there's no problem. Steve Jobs used to, used to say, well, in Buddhism, there's the concept of beginner's mind. He said, it's wonderful to have a beginner's mind. And that's this innocence, this, this ignorance, right? So conceptual innovators, they come to a new problem and they see some radical new solution that nobody would have dreamt of if they'd studied the problem for 20 years, because it's something completely out from, you know, we say from left field. It's interesting what you said about uh, conceptual innovators are able to kind of take unrelated things and simplify it. And it's kind of go back to some of uh, the ideas that I have around intersection of disciplines. In a way, in our education system, in our job environment, we are so focused on specializing that we are very good in what we are doing, but we don't see outside of our uh, realms. And that's, in my own humble opinion, kind of reduce our ability to make these unrelated connections. Yeah, the conceptual innovators are the people who, they, again, they're these young iconoclastic people who sort of ignore their teachers in that sense. They, they learn the history. And, and, you know, so Steve Jobs knew the history of the markets that he studied. Picasso knew art history inside and out. But it's, it's I, I think, the best... The best single statement about this was a critic named Peter Woolen made this statement about Jean-Luc Godard. Godard, again, was one of these iconoclastic young geniuses whose first movie, Breathless, was the most important thing he ever did. And Woolen said that there's this paradoxical thing that you find in Godard, 
that he had this enormous reverence for the past. He knew he was encyclopedic in the history of movies, but he had a complete unwillingness to follow its conventions. He broke every rule. And this is, I mean, you see this in art after art. I mean, Picasso based, he would have told you, he said Cezanne was his god, right? Cezanne, he, he immediately took Cezanne, Cubism came from Cezanne. And, and Cubism and Fauvism, Matisse's Fauvism, same thing, another con radical conceptual innovation. They're both, they would have, both Picasso and Matisse said, these come from Cezanne. But if Cezanne had seen their work, he would have hated it. But it's, and the irony is that their work is what made Cezanne the most important artist of his time because that's influence. He changed the way artists make paintings. But this is what I think of as the protean nature of innovation. Um, conceptual innovators take from the past in ways that the people who made the art never would have intended and would have hated in most cases. So we talked about what makes a conceptual innovator successful. I want to know what makes experimental innovators successful. For the experimental innovators that are listening to us, what they need to keep in mind? Because I think the former one are much more famous. The experimentalists have to realize, and very often they have to sw swim against the current in this, they have to realize that they're marathoners. So that in many disciplines, there's this pressure to do something different. I mean, I felt that when I was young. You know, a, 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 teacher, of, a, a teacher of mine who, who really had my best interests at heart, but really misunderstood my work, he said, you have to finish your dissertation and then do something completely different. Well, that's good advice for conceptualists, but it's exactly the wrong advice for an experimentalist. It's as if, you know, you wanted to win an Olympic marathon and you hired a coach who was a sprinter. And that, might, that person might have the best intentions of the world, but training somebody to win a sprint is not the same thing as training them to win a marathon. So what experimentalists have to do is to understand. They have to resist the temptation to compete with these young conceptual innovators who are getting ahead, and they're not. Uh, because the success of an experimentalist depends on deep understanding understanding a product, understanding a market uh, that they accumulate over time. I haven't studied many innovators, but, but a wonderful example of a very great experimental innovator who did exactly this was Mohammed Yunus, right? He was uh, originally from Bangladesh. He got a PhD in the United States. He went back to Bangladesh when it became independent. He was excited about statehood and he became the chairman of the economics department at his undergraduate alma mater in Chittagong. But in 1974, there was a devastating famine in Bangladesh. And he said, my neoclassical economics could not explain it. And it was very, very graphic. I mean, he said, you know, the people were very quiet. They were very well behaved. But you come out in the morning and people would have simply died in the street. And he was at wit's end. He, again, he said these wonderful Hollywood movies didn't bear on the reality he saw around them. So in desperation, he went into a nearby village and he said, the people of Jobra would be my professors. So now at the age of 35, he said, the poor taught me an entirely new economics. He just went to people and said, what are your problems? And out of that came a completely new form of banking. By trial and error, he said he invented micro lending. And it's interesting because he showed that it was successful in his village of Jobra. He, he, he just lent these tiny amounts of money to these villagers, but it turned out it freed them from the clutches of money lenders who were seizing their profits, right? Cents a day, a few, just a few pennies a day. But he said he couldn't believe that made the difference. But when he saw that it was successful, he would just lend very, very small amounts of money to these women who were making these baskets and their repayment rates were 99%. So then he went to a bank and he said, look, you guys are in the business of banking. You've got to take this over and, and make these loans. And they said, we can't do that. That's ridiculous. They won't repay the loans. He said, they do repay the loans. It's empirical. But they said, well, there's no paperwork. It's not worth doing paperwork for 20 cents a day, right? So they refused to break the rules of banking. And so he had to do it himself, right? So he expanded at the age of 40. He quit his job as a professor. And he was sad to do it, but he realized he had to. And he invented the, he founded the Grameen Bank, which went on to become the largest bank in Southeast Asia, and for which he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Amazing. Right? And he said, I just did this step by step. I didn't want to do it. I had to do it. I didn't know some of the steps were right, some of them were wrong. It's just, and he said, again, the poor taught me an entirely new economics. This is not a theorist. This is somebody who wanted to be a theorist. He was a very mediocre economic theorist. He was a very great 
experimental innovator. David, I have a question. Do you think it's easy or is it possible to move between types of innovations? It's almost impossible. I say almost because there are a few cases. See, a lot of people change from one type to the other in the course of what I call, yeah, with writers, they call this finding your voice. You start out as one and then you discover that's wrong. Cezanne, for example, as a young painter, was trained in, in art school in X to make preparatory drawings and then to make final paintings. But then he went to work with Pissarro and he discovered that the true Cezanne was, was experimental and he never made preparatory drawings. So in that sense, people change, but that's really just you know, education. There are very few examples of people, you know, people say, wow, I want to be conceptual when I'm young and, and experimental when I'm old. The problem is these are differences in the way you think. Conceptualists are deductive, they're theorists. They see the world in black and white in very simple terms. That's what allows them to make these radical changes. And, and what robs, robs them of their creativity as they get older, the world necessarily becomes more complex and they can no longer cut through the complexity. That's the problem. Whereas experimentalists, for just innately, they see the world in shades of gray. And for somebody who sees very new, nuanced differences, it's almost impossible to simplify to the extent that you need to, to, to be a conceptual innovator. So it's very, very rare that anybody can change from one to the other. There are, there are very few, I've found three cases in the history of Western art of people who did make important contributions early as conceptual and important contributions late as experimental, but the circumstances are you know, almost impossible to replicate. You can't consciously say, I'm gonna do this. There are many, in, in, for example, in economics, there are many theorists who realize that they're not gonna make important contributions as they get on in their 30s. They try to become empiricists, but they're usually very bad empiricists because they wanna force data into these molds. They can't see the complexity of, of empirical analysis. So they're not, they're, they become empiricists, but very bad ones. So the recommendation basically for every experimental or every innovator, learn who you are and maybe focus on that. If you are experimental, give yourself the time. Understand that you are the marathon runner. You are part of the, the one that will take it step by step. And yes, maybe you will create a great company. Not in your 20s, not in your 30s, but in your 40s, 50s, and maybe even your 60s. David, we are getting into the end of our conversation, but there is few, a few more questions I want to ask you. One of them is that you opened my mind and my eyes to something that you said about how you study art history classes and why you think we need to do the same in the business world. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Because that was really a beautiful observation of how art actually can help us develop new ways of thinking that are relevant to our businesses. This came from personal experience, and it was sort of an accident. Um, again, you know, I loved art. I was an economics major in college, but when I was a senior in college, there was a tradition at my university. You wrote a senior thesis, and mine was on the economics of the Texas cattle drives, and I loved doing it. Every afternoon, I was in the library reading microfilms from Texas and Kansas newspapers, and it was very time-consuming. But the flip side of that was, at the university, there were courses that were known to be very easy courses, but very entertaining courses for seniors. And I took two wonderful art courses as a senior that just opened my eyes. You know, I thought I knew a lot about art growing up, going to museums. Um, and one of the things that I realize now is that studying the history of painting can show us innovation much more graphically than in any other activity because there's this immediacy to it. I mean, you know, we can talk about a great innovation in Ulysses, the novel Ulysses, or in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, we have to talk about it. We can't hold 500 pages of novel in front of us, right? But in these art history courses, and the same thing is true in economics, we can't hold an entire article in front of us, literally, um, and understand the contents. But in an art history course, they put up a painting on a screen. And it's a painting you can say, I, I know this artist, I know this painting. And then I discovered the, the lecturer could show me things in that painting that I'd never seen. Literally things that they would call your attention to. And I discovered also, they could put up a, a painting by an artist that I didn't like. If the, the lecturer, and these were two exceptional lectures, these were wonderful art historians, I discovered they could make me like any painting that they loved. 
And the, the reason about it was that, you know, I said, innovations are, are combinations of previously unrelated elements. Well, you know, I still remember there was an entire lecture on the Demoiselle d'Avignon, this great painting by Picasso. And, and two of the elements, they're, they're elements of Cezanne that come from the fastening. The individual brushstrokes of Cezanne become the fastening, the breaking up of these forms of, of cubism. But at the same time, there are these African faces. Well, both, they can show you, they can point to those. They can show you a painting by, by Cezanne. They can show you how that leads to the fastening. They can put up an African mask and they can show you how that leads. So they're not just telling you. They're showing you, and it's very, very powerful to see this in front of you, right? So that's an example of how, you know, for, and for example, for experimental innovation, the, in very rapid order, you can go through 20 Cezanne views of Mont Saint-Victoire as if it's a newsreel, you know, as if it's a sequence, and you can see the change over time. You can see it. So, you know, again, it's wonderful when a literature professor would describe how Ernest Hemingway's style changed over his career, but the immediacy of seeing this is just much more powerful. And there's, there's no other discipline where you have this, they call it presentness in art history. You can be present in a way that you can't in other disciplines. So that's, that's an example of why I think, you know, the history of painting is a particularly good one for seeing the difference, for seeing what innovation consists of, but then also for seeing the difference between experimental and conceptual innovators. And then you spoke about this ability to dissect a painting for that matter, or a product for that matter to its basics and actually understanding the innovation of each part of it. And that's a practice that you said, unfortunately, we don't do enough in the world of business, dissecting it to its core element of innovation, not necessarily what it's constructed or made of, but what led to the innovation in order to understand better the product and the services around us. But it's something you realize when you, when you study the history of art because scholars of art, make their, they make their living by, sh by telling you, showing you what is new in these paintings. The bad ones, don't, they don't understand it, but the really good ones can say, look, here are the specific innovations of Andy Warhol, right? You know, the soup cans were this radical innovation. Why? Well, it's mechanical reproduction, right? That's one. They're serial. He, make, he makes a series of the same images. That's two. Um, and it's based on photography, right? Those innovations changed art. If you look today, I mean, in 1950, there were no major works of art based on mechanical reproduction. Now they're all over the place, right? If you go to gallery, if you go to 100 galleries in New York City, 50 of them will have works either using mechanical reproduction or based on it. Seriality, you'll see 20 of those galleries will have serial works. Photography, photography was a minor art in 1960. Today it's a major art. Paintings based on photographs would be in 75 of those 100 galleries. And that dates from Warhol. Then nobody ever does anything by themselves. There were other artists doing the same thing. Warhol was the leader. And those are the specific innovations that Warhol made. And again, you can see them. We don't have to argue about them. We can just walk in the gallery and say, we can, you know, if there's any question, we can say to the dealer, does he paint from photographs? And the answer will be yes. I love it. The, the way you connected art history classes in business analysis of innovation. Uh, David, who is your uh, favorite artist? My favorite artist is a relatively minor abstract expressionist named Sam Francis. Um, he was from the Bay Area. He ended up, he lived in Paris for a time, but he was a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley. And I grew up, my parents taught at Berkeley. My, my mom always took me to, to shows at the, at the University Art Gallery. And one of the shows, it turns out, I, learned, I subsequently learned, was in the mid 60s, it was the first museum show that Francis had ever had. And it came to the Berkeley Museum because he was a graduate, he was an alumnus of the University of California. And I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, he painted these abstract blue forms um, they were entirely new to me. I thought they were the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. And the, the funny thing is now, 50 years later, I still believe that. I still, I still think his art is among the most beautiful things that have ever been created in, in Western civilization. And I remember that when we talked and I asked you about James Torell, because James Torell is one of my favorite artists, and then apparently both of them worked together in the studio 
in Santa Monica. So I don't know if it's a coincidence that also connect both of us that the one of my favorite artists work with your favorite artist. So maybe there is superstitious connection. See, it's, it's another thing that's true of business. It's true of art. Collaboration is now more and more important in, in scholarship. It's more and more important, I think, in business. And it's even becoming more important in art. And the fact that Terrell and Francis collaborated, one of the things they collaborated on turns out with these, these sky paintings. And I never understood that in, in Francis's work. They would rent helicopters and have them trail basically smoke of various colors out and they would create paintings on the sky. This is a visual thing. It doesn't last very long. It's something you have to see. And it turns out they collaborated on this. Terrell was interested in environmental art in light. Francis was interested in writing on the sky. So they were both experimentalists. And in art, experimentalists collaborate, conceptualists collaborate, never the twain shall meet, right? You don't, experimentalists and, and conceptualists don't collaborate because they would constantly run into constitutional problems. They would argue, let's not do that, let's do this, and so on. Whereas Terrell and, and Francis could both say, we're trying to create some visual effect on the sky, how do we do it? Yeah, I think the project, uh, Rodin uh, Crater of James Torrell, he started it in the 70s and it's still not completed. And he expects to complete it in the next 10 years. I think it's a great example for experimental that have a vision and just go with it for the next 50 years. David, one last question. What is the role of the artist, in your opinion? Uh, you know, that's a very difficult question. And I think my only answer would be personal. Um, there are, I mean, you know, somebody said it's sort of bizarre in the 21st century that people would still be putting paint on canvases. I mean, what a crazy thing to do. And, you know, I'm not a philosopher. And in this sense, I'm not even an economist. There are just many, many people who love art. And it's also the case that it has one of the oldest traditions among the arts. And there's, you know, it's my experience, like when you look at a Sam Francis, somebody, you know, my friends will say, oh, you know, my kid could do that. No, they couldn't. I mean, when I see a Sam Francis, I always, I always <laughs> compare it. I, I, grew up, I grew up, Chinese food was the big treat when I was a kid. Right, you know, we'd go to Chinatown in San Francisco, but for some reason, I'd never had mushu pork. I don't know whether that's a regional thing or what. But when I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, going to school, went to a restaurant and I had mushu pork with a friend, and I couldn't believe how good it was. And I thought, this is an extraordinary thing. And I knew just from seeing the perfection of it, this wasn't something that restaurant had invented. You could see, you, you have this sense, there are centuries of tradition that lead to this. And there are in Chinese cuisine. And I feel the same thing when I see a great painter today. There are these traditions. Um, so, you know, people don't like it. They're free not to look at it. But there are these people who, who really love these things. The saddest thing for me this year about the pandemic, I, I had to cancel a trip to Madrid and I miss seeing the Velazquez's. It's just, you know, I feel I can't wait to get back to Madrid to go to the Prado. I can't wait for you to visit. Then we, we can meet and see art uh, uh, together. I will look forward to it. David, thank you very, very much. I think that to kind of summarize this conversation, I, I want to use two quotes, one of Cezanne and one of Picasso, that will maybe articulate the whole conversation about experimental and conceptual innovators. Cezanne said, I seek in painting. Picasso said, I don't seek, I find. I highly recommend all of you to read the book of uh, David, Young Geniuses, Old Masters. You will see it in every discipline of the art, from film to poetry to novelist to painter, how those two types of innovators are influencing our life. And think about for yourself, what are you, experimental or conceptual? David, once again, thank you very, very much. It was really a pleasure. I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, have a great day. Thank you. We are producing our podcast without any ads, and we are relying on our community's direct support. People like you, our listeners. So if you find it valuable, I will be super grateful if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and maybe a review. It will take you just 30 seconds to do so and it is very helpful in getting these ideas to a wider audience. If you are interested to develop your artistic mindset, if you are looking to grow your business, if you want to develop the innovation competencies in your organizations, I will highly recommend you to check our workshops and trainings. 
all available on our website. The episode was mixed and mastered by Daniel Duran. You can subscribe to the Artian Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. So I will be waiting here for you in the next episode with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.